Equity is probably one of the most, um, one of the hottest topics in the mo at the moment in the debate on benefit sharing and, and incentive mechanisms. And it's, it's all very well saying that we want to include equity and to ensure equity, but we really need to ask ourselves what we mean by that. What exactly do we mean by the term? Um, most discussions of equity involve some notion of fairness, of justice, um, and immediately those two terms um, are, are, are pretty controversial and, and incredibly contentious. Um, thinking about equity as opposed to equality and the design of incentive mechanisms immediately involves us favoring certain groups, and this requires some kind of consensus over who and which of those groups is the most deserving, and in a sense that's where the problem comes. Um, we in C4 carried out a, a review to look at the different discourses around this, this question, particularly in the, in the red debate. And what we find that there's, there's a number of often very conflicting discor discourses around, or ju justifications, if you like, about who should benefit. Um, for example, the most common assumption that we make when we think about equity is that benefits should accrue to, to the poorest or the most marginalized groups. And in the forest sector, we, um, this is linked to the idea that it is the, um, those groups who have been particularly successful in protecting forests should, should benefit. For example, some indigenous, um, indigenous groups. But both of these, again, are quite problematic when we start to think about um, performance-based market mechanisms. Um, because, in fact, those mechanisms are based on the notion of, of rewarding those who have provided an, eco an environmental service. And it's, it's, it's not always the same groups that are marginalized. Um, and linked to this discourse, well, another strong discourse, of course, in this whole debate on, on environmental services is that of that those who are incurring the highest cost should, should, should be compensated. Um, and, but at the same time, there's an equally strong discourse about, about tenure, and that it's those with legal rights who have the right to, to accrue benefits. So, um, but of course, the legal debate is, is equally problematic because um, it, it excludes uh, all sorts of groups who, who have weak claims or whose rights have not been recognized. Um, and finally, there's a, a very relevant debate, which we're seeing at, at all levels, which is about, if you like, what level of profit should accrue to the state um, or to private sector operators who are acting as facilitators of these mechanisms, of, of the implementation of RED, for example. Um, and this debate is related, in a sense, to the degree to which that environmental service is seen as a national good, which from which um, citizens or the nation should benefit versus the argument that it is a private group from which private landholders or community groups could benefit. So as you can see, just, this is just one of the issues surrounding equity, these definitional issues. Um, and there's a lot of challenges even in that, in that question. Um, so I look forward to exploring this issue and a whole number of other, of other issues which I'm sure the speakers will raise. Um, so on that note, I will move on to introducing our speakers. Um, what, who we've got here today to just discuss our topic is Mr. Sway Set, from, who will talk about a national, a national development model that promotes smallholder farmers in Myanmar. Um, and this is a really excellent opportunity for us to think about the way incentive and, and uh, mechanism and instruments can fit into a, a picture of larger national development. Um, and we can learn from this approach in terms of um, a, an approach which cuts across a number of sectors in a country where there are a lot of exciting local level of initiatives emerging in a context of quite significant larger scale development. Uh, Mr. Swayset is the governance manager at Action Aid, and he's an active member of the Land Core Group in Myanmar. Next up, we have Mr. Van, Pham Van Chung, who is the Senior Program Officer in the Vietnam Administration of Forestry and part of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, and he, has, he works on the, on the PEST scheme. So he will bring us lessons from the, the implementation of this scheme. Um, Vietnam is a country where some of the most sophisticated thinking about PEST is actually taking place, PEST and equity in particular. And I'm really delighted to have him have this opportunity for us to hear more. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Naya Paudel, who's a senior researcher in Forest Action Nepal. And he will bring us lessons on benefit sharing and community forest sy forestry systems in Nepal. 
And um, as you all probably know, Nepal has probably the richest history of engagement and thinking over decades around equity uh, in the community forestry systems. Um, and bringing up the finale, we have Mr. Iwan Wibisono from the Red Indonesian Raid Agency. And he will bring us some hot off the press lessons from the, the benefit sharing system which the, the agency is in the process of designing, both at the national level and the subnational level. Okay, so the format of this session is that each speaker will talk for 12 minutes. Um, and during that time, please collect your burning questions because what we'll do is actually have a discussion at the end rather than intersperse the presentations with discussions. And just a, a reminder to turn off your mobile phones, which I forgot to do in the last session. So, um, Okay, so with that, I ask you to join me in giving your full attention to Mr. Set. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, I came all along with um, the fact that I need to prepare for the presentation on national development model that promotes smallholder farmer in this submit. But it's all about forest, uh, and I, I will try to touch upon how it is linked with forest um, uh, situation in Myanmar. But I almost uh, prepare for the land grab situation how, uh, and in the reform process, as you may be aware that this morning our minister has already introduced to you all uh, that Myanmar is in its, in its transition and implementing its current reform processes. So this is my outline of the, to of the talk. Uh, I will talk about smallholder farmers, they are backbone, and how Land grab is happening in the country and, and in the, on the rise of uh, how land and uh, security, insecurity has happened and impact of recent reforms, how it is uh, contributed and how it is not clear to the people of Myanmar at the moment. And farmland law and wasteland law, we, and, and it's in fact recently formulated in two years ago, but still there are many questions and uh, on these two laws and its, its, its implementation and growth of industrial agribusiness that is government supported and how it is linked with the uh, forest uh, consumption in the country and why smallholders are better. This is what we stand for. We are uh, standing with the smallholder farmer and what Myanmar needs to do. And uh, two, three slides uh, recommendation and what Myanmar has been done so far. And 70% uh, of Myanmar population are rural population, and most of them are farmers, and including fish, fisher farmers. So that's why three-fourths of the population, about 40 million people, still live in a rural area and heavily rely on farmland and forest for their daily needs and livelihoods. And agriculture, in this sense, is, is uh, very much contributed to national GDP, which is about one-third of the GDP still, and 15% of the total export earnings and employs over 60% of the nation's labor force. Uh, so farmers and land in this regard is very important to us at, and Myanmar economic, political and social and cultural reasons. And how, then how land grab is happening? Over the last decades, land has been confiscated for various reasons by different actors, but farmers were not able to raise their voices. But uh, at the, right now, along with the reform process, uh, there are many spaces provided, but uh, farmer voices are still limited uh, because they do not know how to engage with the media and how to raise their voices, and they are not yet uh, fully informed and educated on how to raise their voice. In the past decade, an increase in land grabs for infrastructure development like road construction, dam construction, and special economic zone, especially in ethnic nationality areas, which are border areas are next to China, Thailand, and India, and especially in those uh, three countries. And state-sponsored agricultural projects, which is run by SEE, state enterprise. And uh, military cantonment is one of the factors uh, for the land grab. And since 1991, there is a wasteland instruction uh, which gives uh, private sector to own land for in, uh, industrial agriculture. And the idea of industrial agriculture is introduced in this time. And uh, then the risk of, of our land tenure insecurity is, is increasing. It, and, and in that, there are other factors uh, to lose the land. 
For example, human conflict wars and natural disaster. And here I would like to put more focus on climate change, which is a wicked problem to our countries. In terms of formulating national development uh, model, which uh, should be beneficial to, the, uh, to people, especially poor people, climate change is still a wicked problem how to take account into our development, comprehensive development plan. Still quite challenging. Then uh, land governance is still poor and not clear yet. Only the one department, two departments mainly, one is uh, settlement or land record department and general administration department at the local government level are, are managing and administering land allocation uh, before the two new land law was formulated. But after two new land law was uh, formulated, and introduced to the country, and it was supposed to be implemented by 2013 for the land registration. But it was not quite clear to the people uh, the procedure of reg registration and how they will get uh, their rights, as, uh, for example, holding rights, as, uh, and they can mortgage or not. It's not quite clear yet. And weak support system to farmers, they have very limited access to uh, cre uh, credits and lack of capital and also not affordable technology they have. And they have very much less inform on market information. And, and most of, in many cases in the country, uh, broker came to the community and just uh, exchange. Uh, and, and pharma, especially from the remote area, access less, less to the market. And uh, speculation of hot money trying to make a quick profit or unregistered sales of land. This is a com very common problem. There is a patch of land which we think the uh, waste land, but it is not. And the, the land market is already happening in the country uh, with the uh, unregistered sales of land. And the increase of risk of losing land and therefore increasing land tenure insecurity. And, and especially in ethnic nationality areas, uh, they have their own customary land tenure practices. But uh, uh, the, the, two, the two law, do not recognize their practices. And this is dis uh, discontent and national and rural. And media reports land conflicts along with the reform on a daily basis increasingly. But um, there is no such a kind of concrete solution provided to, not only to the people, but by the media as well. An average area of a household or farm plots have been decreasing in some area and of five acres. It is below subsistence, especially in dry zone. For five members of family, they own one acre, sometimes 0.5 acre, and in the extended family, and also migration in, 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 in relation with this, uh, since they cannot give, they cannot give uh, land to their children, their children migrate to the urban area, and uh, they are less educated at the moment. And food insecurity is a major issue, especially in Chin State, uh, which is next to India. And uh, landlessness and land poor household on the rise, especially for women had at once. And women entitlement in our country is not clear. There are some old practices that women can entitle the land, but there is no such a legalized or officialized land entitlement uh, clearly uh, stated in any law. Especially a problem in conflict areas near the border. That, that means the ethnic nationality in northern, uh, and, and, and northern east and, and, and northern west of the country, China. Thailand and uh, India border. And new lands and policies have been and will be passed that will increase pressure on farmers and livelihoods. Then how? Uh, because of unclear procedure and limited time, uh, the, the farmers are informed to register their land again and, uh, by the end of 2013. But the procedure is very, really complicated. The Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation is the focal ministry to, in order, uh, to do so. But especially in the conflict area, how to register the land. And uh, those coming back who uh, ran away from the country for armed um, conflict, uh, this procedure is also very much not clear and, and could not em envisage in the two new land laws. And in Kenyan state, next to Thailand, they have their own legal uh, framework for the land entitlement and land rights. But when it comes into, along with the peace process, when they come into uh, mainstreaming, pol uh, political mainstreaming, which legal framework will be applying? And the local people who return to the country is are not very clear which legal framework they have to apply. So this, that sort of 
uh, impact in vegan fellow and virgin land law, which, is, which were formulated in 2012, and special economics as is a law, especially in ethnic nationality area. Uh, with this law, there are a lot of such, uh, special economic zones which grab more lands including forest land. And in the, in, the, in, in another Ministry of Forest, this particular area is protected or conserved, or conserved forest area. But in reality, in the ground, people are living out there, which is a kind of land encroachment issue. The Ministry of Forest has been addressing in a, in the, with a mechanism of community forestry mechanism over the last three decades already. But uh, there is no such... Um, uh, formal acknowledgement in the law that the community forestry is uh, is useful for the people, and and there is no uh, participatory forestry management scheme uh, in our country, which is now uh, I am sure the government is still considering to take uh, action, and they they are very much positive to adopt the, that kind of participatory for, uh, forestry management and foreign investment law. This is very much uh, particular problematic in our country. Uh, along with the reform, while we are inviting uh, investing, investment from foreign direct investment, investment from the regional countries, uh, the most problematic law is this, because it is related with land, and uh, the investor usually asks for the land, but in and they assume Myanmar is said um, Asia last resource frontier. And assuming the investor assuming that uh, there might be a lot of, of, of land. Okay, <laughs> but in reality, are, uh, the land is already people already lived for decades and, and generation, and the, the thing is that we have uh, 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 you know a poor record system. So the foreign investment law is now under review, and we have national investment law. These two laws will be combined in the in the revised version coming soon in the parliament. Okay, that is uh, trying to legal. Uh, uh, lies land use titles and, and it, it should explain rights to transfer and mortgage inherit gain and from legally permitted use etc. And in the land and title program that what I, I have already a uh, weight already on the upland area, upland shifting cultivation we call shape downtown are not recognized in new law and their land entitlement is not sure and they cannot entitle uh, according to the law. And to buy and sell land use titles on the market is like I explained, along with the foreign investment law, companies will be able to lease land for up to 50 years with two 10 year extension. And whatever the land, uh, the virgin land, the wasteland they, uh, they said, but in reality, people are living out there. And lands without official land use title can be given to private sector. And farmers that have cultivated and paid taxes for wasteland for years have never been granted Ubai, which is in fact cut down trees in, in their former generation and they a, a plot and they a grow trees over there. And then what is, they, this is called Ubai, but it, it never be registered. And when the law uh, came into the scene and they had to re-register their land and their entitlement is not sure yet, uh, especially in ethnic nationality and upland area. So Ministry of Agriculture, coal in their 30 year development plan uh, to cover, to convert 10 million acres of wasteland, but in reality there is not that much uh, for private industry agriculture with these industrial crops, palm oil, jetrufa, rubber, and cassava, and sugarcane. And in the, it is down in the south, uh, palm oil is very much uh, uh, problematic right now, and rubber is the second problematic area in, in our country, which contribute to the climate change, which is wicked to national development, uh, comprehensive development plan. So the, this is in fact a, a, a kind of figure that is, uh, and I just would like to show you in Kitchen State and in Indai, which is uh, uh, north part of the country and down, down, down south of the country, where many of the acres are grabbed by the companies for this industry agriculture. And this is 2011 data, and, uh, and the, then and you might be heard of this Kachin uh, conflict uh, in uh, that increase attention of the land and tenure and security and that questions a lot. Okay. And, and it's part of China, especially in the northern part of Myanmar, uh, China's opium drug substitution program uh, create a lot of landlessness, food insecurity and land erosion because they remove many of the people, local people, and substitute with this, situ uh, with this opium drug substitution is it mainly with rubber. 
but be, uh, local people do not know how to uh, grow rubber and, and less technology is uh, provided to them and they have no market information at all and this is in fact the uh, uh, and this 2012 data uh, that I got from uh, TNI research a uh, disopposition in uh, financing disopposition in northern Shen state in Myanmar and these are the acres of land granted for the companies and government organizations so the, the industry agricultural model that the government is trying to support will allocate wasteland to businessmen and the farmers will lose their land and uh, they will also lose their livelihood and they, be, will, they will become wages, laborers and extremely they are vulnerable because they do not know how to cope with the situation and they have very much less access to uh, services uh, provided by the government. And why smallholder then can be better? They can be more economically efficient than the industrial farms if provided if with affordable credit technology and inputs. That has to be reflected in our policy formulation. And they, they can contribute to national economic development and food security. Food security is a special issue in Chin State. And, that, and, and uh, smallholder farmer can promote social stability this is, uh, I think, uh, the civil society standpoint, especially in ethnic nationality conflict prone area. And multi cropping is much better for the soil. And that is what Myanmar needs to do. We have to have a kind of affordable uh, capital loans to the farmers, and technology should be affordable, and extension services should be affordable and accessible by the farmers. And improve market access, including for export, and freedom of crop choice. We have uh, almost no freedom of crop choice. We are asked to grow this particular uh, crop by the government and we have to and we have to pay tax for the crop and that is in fact in discussion with the government and government is increasingly acknowledging on the freedom of crop choice and fair legal resources for land disputes uh, now at the moment centralized uh, ministry has been uh, has been settling the land dispute but uh, uh, with the parliament, we have been trying to have a kind of parallel body to to settle the land dispute and market-based compensation for land taken in the national interest. And um, this is, in fact, I have already done to recognize customary land rights in, uh, in uh, land laws. And we have done land symposium in 2012 with the lead of Ministry of Environmental and Conservation and Forestry, and which recommend government to, be, to invest and, uh, and safeguard pro boa livelihoods and also forest, uh, participatory forest management. And foreign investment law is reviewed, that I have already talked. And spatial plan, sectoral plan, is, has been uh, participatory. According to the president instruction, it has to be people center, which is uh, at the moment a uh, hope to uh, promote a uh, 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 development model that promotes smallholder farmer. And that should be beneficial. And that will uh, include all our uh, participatory way that people can participate their concerns and needs and those especially uh, uh, people who encroach to the forest, uh, uh, what is their rights, etc., can be discussed and can be integrated into the plan. So this is um, end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you for um, opening ses this session with the, the big picture um, and locating it within um, in it, if you like, the picture of the of cross-sectoral national development. I think that's very useful. Um, and, yeah, the acute problem of inequity of access, if you like. But maybe we'll come back to some of your, um, the, the measures that you are suggesting or you have experience of. Um, I think you, you had a lot to say, so it'd be nice to come back to that in the discussion. Okay, um, I'd like to move on now to um, introduce... Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chung, and he will talk about um, a payment for environmental services in Vietnam. Do you, do you want to stand up? Or? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to meet here, all of you here. Uh, I would like to present on the implementation of uh, payment for forest environmental service in Vietnam. The content of the, my presentation uh, includes background mobilization of the PFAS payment, uh, current status, equity, and challenges. Uh, 
I should say that Vietnam is the first country in Asia to initiate a national-wide PFAS scheme. Uh, we have Vietnam Forestry Development Strategy 2006 to 2020, and then uh, government issued the degree number five on the Forest Protection and Development Fund. And after that, uh, issues, the government issued the decision 380 on the payment for forest environmental service and piloted in two, two provinces, Lâm Đồng province and Sơn La province. And after two years, um, we have degree number 99 on the um, policy for PFAS applied national wide. About the re relationships uh, on the PFAS policy, the first is the relationship with uh, buyer and the seller applied to the direct payment. The second is the uh, traditional relationships uh, on controlling of the forest quality and quality outside of the uh, PFAS scheme. Uh, number three is uh, relationships on the monitoring and evaluation uh, for PFAS implementation. Number four is uh, uh, relationships on signing the contract uh, for the PFAS applied to the direct payment. About the payment uh, sources, we have a uh, uh, power plant, water, uh, water supply, industrial production, tourists, and carbon sequestration, aquaculture. Uh, for the hydro power plant, have to pay uh, 20 Vietnam dong per kilowatt hour, and water supply have to pay 40 Vietnam dong per cubic meter, and for tourist facility, have to pay one to two percent annual income, and for the rest, uh, and to, uh, natural, um, uh, sorry, industrial production and carbon uh, sequestration aquaculture is uh, under development for the garden line, and uh, hopefully when it will be implemented in the coming year. Uh, about the past revenue, until now, uh, we received the, around um, 147 uh, million uh, US dollar. In there, around eight, uh, 98 percent from hydropower plant, and uh, around two percent from clean water, and around 0 0.1 percent from tourist facility. Uh, the past uh, about the utilization uh, procedure. Uh, the past user will pay 100% to the Vietnam Forest Protection Fund. It's a central fund. Uh, in uh, uh, there, we keep 0.5% for administration costs and 99.5% uh, ch transfer to the provincial forest protection development fund. Uh, as there, they keep maximum 10% for administration costs and 5% for contingency. And 85% uh, transfer to the forest owner. And if the forest owner is a household or individual, they can keep, uh, they can use 100% uh, of receipt amount. And if the uh, forest owner is organization, uh, they can deduct 10% for administration cost. Uh, about the impact, uh, economy impact, uh, I should say that implementation of the PFAS policy is increasing the contribution of the forest sector in uh, national economy. Uh, until now, we signed uh, 281 uh, in trust contract with uh, hydropower plants, uh, water suppliers, and uh, tourist facilities. And uh, three, uh, 35 funds are established. Annual revenue uh, about 50 million US dollar about the environmental impact. Uh, violation case from forest management and protection have been reduced uh, about 40 percent, uh, as you see on the table. The violet uh, is uh, since 2008, it uh, more than three million hectare, but uh, it's reduced into um, around 700 uh, hectare in 2013, and about. 4.1 million hectares were determined to implement PFAS in there. Around 3.6 million hectares were contracted for forest protection. And in uh, the 2013, around 2.8 million hectares were received the PFAS payment. Uh, I should say that the, the implementing the PFAS policy is uh, contribute to increase the forest coverage in the Vietnam. Uh, for example, in 2008, it, uh, forest coverage uh, around 38.7 percent, and in uh, 2012, it increased to 39.9 uh, percent. Uh, 
uh, I would like to talk about the equity regarding the K coefficient, the total payment to the forest owner per year uh, equal to average unit payment per hectare of forest multiplied to forest air managed for service multiplied K coefficient. In K coefficient, we have a uh, four sub K coefficient. Uh, for the K1 is the uh, forest volume status. For example, the one uh, K one is the rich and 0 0.95 is the medium forest and 0 0.9 is the poor forest. And K2 is for the forest function and K3 forest uh, origination and K4 is uh, the level of difficulty of the forest protection. Uh, about the application of the K coefficient, uh, according to cycle um, 80 issue in 2011 by Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development on the method to determine for PFAS, the people committee of province will based on the specific condition of uh, their province uh, to specify number of the sub K factor applicable to their spe uh, respective province. Uh, I, Actually, the K coefficient have not fully applied due to the lack of forest inventory information. And the province have just applied, uh, applied K2 and K3 coefficient and uh, apply in K uh, equal to 1 in some province. In uh, 2013, we have an um, occasional paper report from C4. I, I should say that it's a very good report so far. And uh, there are some findings and some recommendations uh, relating to the K coefficient. Uh, for example, the using, K, uh, using different K coefficient is appropriate, but it is difficult to explain uh, the system to committees and can revoke conflicts between uh, committee members. And due to the lack of for, uh, fresh inventory data, so local committees have not agreed on the value of the K coefficient. And uh, uh, from my point of view, I, uh, I think it's very good uh, recommendation is that the policy maker must uh, also work toward developing a functional monitoring and MNE system. Actually, about the MNE uh, in, 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 uh, for the past, it regulates in some uh, related um, uh, policy, but it's not um, concentrated in the one policy uh, um, about the MNE system. So I hope that in the coming time we will develop a very uh, good MNE system. Uh, in my country, is the electricity selling price increased, uh, but the payment of buyer have been unchanged so far. For example, uh, electricity price in 2008 is that around uh, 900 uh, Vietnam uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. But until uh, 2013, it's uh, around 1.5 thousand Vietnam dollars per kilowatt uh, hour. There are different uh, level of payment for the forest owner. Uh, the average level of payment uh, in in whole country is around uh, 10.6 US dollar per hectare per year. Uh, the finger in uh, 2013. Uh, and there are two different levels of payment among the basins in some provinces, such as uh, Zalai, Yên Bái, and Đắk Nông, and Kon Tum province, etc. For example, in the table you will see, in Lâm Đông province, the payment level from uh, 14 to 21 US uh, dollar per hectare per year, but in Zalai it's so low, around 0 0.1 to 10 uh, US dollar per hectare per year, and in Yên Bái, from 1 to 22. Uh, for the solution, uh, the, uh, we are now implementing the National Forest Inventory Program uh, period uh, from 2013 to 2016. And one of the very important uh, objectives of the program is uh, supporting to the PFAS payments. Uh, and uh, maybe we, we will propose to revise the degree number 99 on a policy for PFAS and strengthening capacity for government officers and improve communication related to PFAS to the local communities. And also finally guideline the policy related to carbon uh, sequestration, etc. And improve the monitoring and evaluation uh, system. 
Uh, besides the achievement so far, uh, we still have a lot of uh, challenges, uh, such as direction for the PFAS implementation is not timely. Uh, mechanism level of payment for forest owner are not realistic, and uh, payment of hydropower plants are still delayed. Uh, lack of guidelines for the aquaculture carbon sequestration industrial production facility. Okay, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, really fascinating to hear your, um, some of the challenges you faced in operationalizing and thinking around equity. Um, we might want to come back to a discussion about the coefficients because I think there's been some similar work in Nepal. So maybe we could come back to that in the, in the discussion. Um, continuing on this theme of actually operationalizing equity, um, we now have Dr. Podell, who will talk to us about the experience in the community forestry sector in Nepal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am trying to bring um, some of the experiences from last 30 years of community forestry practice in Nepal, and this is part of our comparative study to see um, a study between Nepal and Indonesia to see how the lessons from community forestry in benefiting benefit sharing can be you know can inform the current debate on climate change and particularly rate and how those lessons can be translated into designing or articulating um, benefit sharing mechanism within red or pace um, the question why we look for community forestry, why, why we should revisit community forestry to learn something for it, um, is certainly um, the most important is because community forestry has incentivized local communities to preserve forest, to conserve forest, and that is what we want in red or pace and anywhere. Um, so there is already an inbuilt system in community forestry benefit sharing mechanism which has incentivized local communities, and what, we, what can we learn from there? Um, second is, um, the system that is being developed there is legitimate, you know, almost all people involved in there have respected the, it, and it has been recognized by the national laws. Um, so we can, we can learn a lot from there and can translate it into the RAID mechanism. And third important is, uh, in community forestry, we are not only protecting or conserving timber, or not only biodiversity, not only... So, whole range of ecosystem goods, services, uh, we are protecting there. And if we want to rate plus, um, certainly a lot of lessons from community forestry uh, could be important. Um, we will be highlighting here how the tenure arrangement, uh, particular kind of a tenure arrangement would be helpful um, to understand community forestry and why those lessons from community forestry is useful for RAID if we were to uh, incentivize local communities. So our focus is primarily on um, state land managed by the local communities. Um, and how the benefit distribution between the state and community and within community works um, in those contexts. Um, now I move to Nepal's community forestry, um, which has um, a very good successful history of last three decades. Um, and it involves a huge number of people. Um, it's a government's major program. Um, almost 25% of the forest is now under community forest system and it's been seen as a successful initiative uh, in terms of uh, supporting local livelihood, in terms of regenerating the already degraded hill forest uh, and providing a lot of uh, diverse benefits uh, including in these days carbon. Now if you see the, the tenure arrangement within community forest um, the land still belongs to the state, the government, um, but the government has transferred certain bundle of rights to local communities so that they can manage, use and exclude non-members and benefit from whatever comes from the community forest. So the law, the, the below, 
says the district forest office officer can hand over uh, any part of national forest to the local communities and then who can manage based on their one operational plan one management plan to manage to sell to use their products fixing their price everything um, so there is a very strong legal basis policy support and also institutional support towards this community forestry and i think um, i will come later why this is very important when we talk to community for uh, sorry benefit sharing um, the current uh, benefit sharing in community forestry um, allows 100% of the benefits coming from the forest to the community. Well, um, there is um, uh, an exception for two species of timber for which they have to pay 15% of the revenue to the government. That is only two species. Uh, certainly, the, the, these are mostly used timber species and the 15 percent is also only when they sell it outside the group, not within the group. And um, despite all these benefits goes to the community, the state still provides service in terms of administrative, regulative, monitoring and capacity building and uh, the uh, renewal of the management plan. Now within the group, um, the benefits um, goes um, different there is a different system for different type of products like for forest product mostly for fuel wood powder grass um, non-timber products so it's based on availability in the forest and also the traditional use by different households different member of the groups and their need for timber it's usually the group collects the timber from the forest and then distributes timber according to the demands or so needs and request by the members. And for the funds, whatever funds is collected in the community forestry user groups fund that is usually invested in community infrastructure, um, including drinking water or roads, school, those things. And the cash is not usually um, distributed to the individual households. Though there are programs to focus on some of the income generating activities for the poor. Now I just want to um, bring two slides for um, uh, aiding up RAID there um, within the community forestry benefit sharing system. Um, in last few years um, there are some piloting going on to design a benefit sharing system within RAID and they have uh, you know, uh, at the national uh, level forest carbon trust fund advisory body and then at the middle level sub national level um, no national level there is a program management unit and at the sub national level there is a watershed level network of these community forest user group and then the benefit that flows up to the user group level um, this is important uh, the rate piloting has um, put two criteria, one certainly the carbon, carbon sequestration annually and the second they have also bring some social criteria including active involvement uh, and benefit sharing to women, uh, to be various marginalized groups like Dalits that we have in South Asia, particularly in Nepal um, and indigenous people and those who are most vulnerable poor. So we have both biophysical criteria, carbon and also social criteria and then calculating based on their forest, based on their carbon increment and also based on their involvement of women or indigenous people or those then they would pay according to their uh, combined criteria. Now we can see a lot of um, innovations uh, in community forestry in terms of uh, you know, developing equitable benefit sharing uh, system there. Um, at the procedural level, at the governance level, um, we have these community forestry user groups uh, at the local level and their network goes up to the national level as a national uh, federation. Uh, we call it FECOFON. Um, and in FECOFON, um, they have a strong provision that there must be 50% women in the leadership in all decision-making bodies. Um, 
and there must be one out of two major posts like the chairperson and the secretary either the chairperson or the secretary must be a woman uh, and that goes from top to the bottom level and the national community forestry guideline has also supported these inclusive criteria uh, you must spend 25% 35% to the proper activities you must have 50% membership of the women you must have 50% uh, leadership of women in the key decision making posts um, so that is there at procedural level and at the substantive level um, there is a practice uh, in almost all community forestry to to conduct this well being ranking based on uh, locally developed criteria uh, category a category b c d based on your financial uh, economic status um, and that category is then integrated into any benefit sharing scheme within the community and that includes um, forest based uh, employment uh, and more importantly uh, allocation of community forestry land into individual households to those identified poor households for a tenure of let's say 20 years 15 years so that they, they have access to whole community forest but also specific to to that allocated smaller pieces of land where they can grow uh, various non-timber forest products or fodder and they can benefit from that smaller pieces and most importantly these days is um, a, a number of community forests and uh, user groups they have developed a system of differential pricing system of for the forest product like one piece of timber one cubic meter of timber would cost different to category a household to category b household to category c household and the poorest group would get cheaper and the richer group would have to pay more for the same piece of timber um, having said of these innovations in community forestry at the local level, we still have a lot of uh, issues uh, at different level, particularly at the national level. And uh, there is an ongoing contestation between the government and the communities regarding the revenue uh, uh, sharing. Government wants to increase that 15% to 50% um, so that uh, the the nation could benefit from a uh, rich um, valuable forest um, there are uh, debate whether the valuable forest should go only to local communities or the total nation um, should benefit from that valuable forest so the the argument from the state part is we need you need to pay tax um, more tax so that from there other people can benefit and also the state has a claim that if we were to support you in terms of capacity building in terms of renewal of management plan and so on and so on so you have to pay for this um, but what local communities are saying is we are generating preserving uh, environmental public good um, so it's not we pay for you it's better you support us we are protecting forest and um, similarly uh, a uh, government seems a bit reluctant to expand community forestry in the lowland bordering to India where there is a much more valuable forest in terms of market price. Um, so there is ongoing debate whether government should expand community forestry in that area or only to limit in a relatively poor forest areas. And also uh, government wants to you know um, prescribe some management uh, guidelines, some benefit distribution guidelines and to the local communities and they are saying that uh, we have the autonomy to manage our forest and to distribute our benefit as per our own rule. So who are you to enforce us? So, so there is an ongoing debate on uh, related to the autonomy of the local groups in terms of sharing this benefit, in terms of developing their own rules, so and so. so um, a number of debate around community forestry, uh, sorry, uh, around benefit sharing is there, uh, but at least at the local level uh, and within the local uh, communities, and uh, the communities are implementing their one system, their one rule, then their one decisions. So I think from, uh, from our experience um, in community forestry, um, I could uh, draw three key lessons. Uh, one, um, the benefit sharing arrangement is very closely linked with the tenure arrangement. 
Um, because the law um, allows, or, or law is very strong in favor of local communities, that's why the local communities are you know, very strong in defending their share uh, from the forest management. Um, there are other forest regimes as well, um, which are not that uh, strong, and that's why they are, not, they are not enjoying that level of benefit. Um, the second is, um, if we only focus at the local level, um, that would be almost impossible to have to enjoy that benefit. So, because the community forestry users, they have their national networks up to the national level, and because there is a strong law uh, to ensure the 50% thing, the inclusion of women, the indigenous people, the distance users, so and so on. That's why these provisions have made possible to share the existing benefits equitably. Um, and the third thing, um, because different uh, people are depending or relying on different components of the bio forest ecosystem, forest biodiversity, um, the benefit sharing system is so much sophisticated that if you translate everything into cash, everything into single uh, item, I think um, that would create s some problem. Currently, because different people are benefiting different way, not all people are asking for timber, not all people are asking for fuel wood. So they rely differently on different products. And if we only target single product like carbon in red, possibly that would, uh, no, um, that wouldn't be able to address the equity issue as currently they are managing because they are using variety of products from forest. Um, I think that's my all. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. We've also got, got a lot to learn from, what is it, three generations of um, lessons around community forestry in Nepal? Is it that long? Um, I think it's really interesting to see the degree to which the debate has now become a national debate around um, uh, the, the rights of non-forest dwellers as well as forest dwellers. Okay, so now we'll move on to Mr. Iba, Iwan Wibisono, who will take us on a journey through the latest thinking and um, workings around benefit sharing of the radio agency in Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's uh, very interesting to listen to all of uh, three speakers and then hopefully you will not fall asleep because I'm the last one for the session. Yeah, it's uh, when we talk about uh, benefit sharing for Red Plus, especially in Indonesia, I'm always will open with this uh, slides and I think it also uh, elaborate uh, quiet detail by the other speakers like how we want to see a benefit sharing uh, process in Indonesia will be uh, designed or will be implemented. On the first one is like we don't want to see that when we dealing especially uh, uh, for Red Plus at the community level we don't want to put community as that uh, uh, disturbed neighbor that they, that we need to compensate them with, let's say, X amount of money because they, maybe some of their rights will be disturbed or some of their rights will be uh, not recognized by the project. So we want to, uh, working on the Red Plus, that community is a part of the Red Plus itself. They are become uh, owner, the shareholder, the co-owner, of the program and then when we talk about benefits mainly we discussing from the perspective of cash there's a lot of question is it possible to distribute the benefit from the red plus in terms of cash if there's the case of the questions we say it's possible but I think when we defining the benefit from red plus we not only about, uh, talk about the benefit in terms of cash, but I think there's a lot of things uh, will be happen if we conducting Red Plus. One of the uh, stronger uh, element that we want to see is like when we talk about the defining benefit from the Red Plus is like how we can recognize the community rights as a part of the benefit that we can deliver uh, from Red Plus. For Indonesian case, I think this is a very relevant one. We have MK35 uh, decisions that recognizing rights of 
hutan adat. So I think we need to working on this, and then I think this is a part of the benefit that we want to see uh, from uh, Red Plus. And then the last one, when we start discussion on the Red Plus, of course, we start with the how we can reduce the emissions, which is that's related with the carbon. But we are in the paper Red Plus, we're saying that that's not enough for us. Because if we only talk about the Red Plus, only about the carbon, we will not including the whole landscape of the forest. What about the other environmental surfaces? The cultural surfaces come from the forest. So I think uh, we also want to see that benefit from uh, forest is not only about the carbon. It can be social benefit, it can be uh, ecological surfaces. From many interaction with the community, actually what they request or what they expected from the Red Plus is not only, mainly it's not about uh, cash or money or something like that, but is it possible through Red Plus it can improve our forest management? Is it possible to strengthen our rights? Yeah, uh, I think there are several uh, elements that are important to uh, be discussed when we defining the benefit from the Red Plus and then also like how we, we are defining uh, beneficiaries because it's also we are reflected how we dealing with the equity concepts. In many discussion with the C4 colleagues, it's always delicate when we try to uh, balancing those aspects. Like in my uh, previous slides, uh, like when we talk about benefit, in several process, there are some strong recognition saying that REPLUS is a bonus at the end of the process, but on the beginning, we need to uh, define what is the other uh, benefit. Of course, this is one of the key elements when we started the REPLUS. And then when we talk about the non-carbon benefit, it can be anything. I think it's important also for us to define what we call as a non-carbon benefit. In international process under UNFCCC, they started to discuss about non-carbon benefit. But I think it's important also for us in Indonesia to define okay, what we call as a non-carbon benefit. And then one of our proposal is like, let's talk about strengthening community rights as one of the benefit from the Red Plus. And then the third one that we identify is like improvement of forest governance. Of course, this is the big titles, but we don't have options that we need to improve our forest governance. And then the Red Plus is one of the tools. Red Plus is not the goal, but I think this is the tools to an opportunity for us to improve uh, forest governance in terms of like transparency, the participatory process, for example. And then I think we also recognize that beneficiaries is very varied. It's depend on like what their interest. It can be from uh, government. When we going to the uh, district or province, they expected that uh, Red Plus also can become part of their additional revenue, the additional income. And for community, of course, they want to have like kind of supports, capacity buildings, improving their livelihood, improving their rights. That's a part of uh, the discussion. And the private, how we will dealing with the private sectors that will be uh, playing key roles. When we're designing uh, Freddy, our funding instruments, we have a scenario that in the futures, that the source of fund for the Red Plus will be like, it. for now, maybe 80% is come from the public sectors, but in the futures, 80% of that, it will be from private sectors. And then it's important to dealing with them and then ensures that Red Plus become the mechanism that can benefit for them. And of course, there's a lot of civil society start working on the Red Plus in Indonesia, like, let's say like five, six, or seven years ago, that they have become a key promoter of the Red Plus and then want to see that the uh, Red Plus will working uh, properly in Indonesia. And then the second element I want to uh, highlight is like how we developing our process. We want to see when, when we started discussing about the Red Plus, we talk about a lot about the safeguards. 
how we creating open process, full participatory process, transparent, inclusive process. This is a very good thing, but build the bridge from the, let's say, from the national level up to the implementation level on the field is a challenging one. When we're developing PRISAI, it's not easy. There's a lot of interest need to be accommodated. When we start to developing our principles, criteria, indicator on from, um, for PRISAI, it's like creating a shopping list. There's a lot of expectation that Red Plus can improve in a lot of things. But we can say that Red Plus cannot solve all of the problem, but will be part of the solution. And then it's important also like usually when we talk about the benefit from Red Plus, we talk about payment for performance. We're thinking at the end. But I think if we can defining that benefit is not only coming at the end of the tunnel, but when we start of the Red Plus process and then we can start to defining what will be the benefit from the whole process. I think also it will be good to see that benefit is not only about how we can get the payment for performance from the carbon. Why I keep mentioning this because there's some frustration I think from few stakeholders saying how long we need to waiting for the carbon money will coming. And from our experience that we wanna have like uh, what we call as like uh, I forgot in English the name is uh, that we take special side uh, affirmative actions that we want to uh, like give a special uh, approach especially when we talk about the community based activities we wanna in like in Beper Red Plus when we developing program we find out that there's a lot of huge potential in the community-based activities. And then I think this is, we hope, uh, hope that this is, will be like one of the, the main ingredients when we are discussing uh, Red Plus in the future. So developing the process is the second one. And then the, the third one, especially, this is the, the, the uh, roadmap on how uh, BP Red Plus uh, want to work seriously on how we uh, will uh, follow up the decision, constitutional court decision number 35. That we hope that in the futures that there will be uh, recognition to the claim of the community, adult community uh, for their forest. And then we hope in the future there's a more uh, lower uh, conflict especially the territorial conflict. Of course, there's a lot of uh, challenge in this, this context, and then I think there will be a lot of work need to be done in the future. And then, yeah, uh, I think several countries have a different context, a different mechanism, and then mainly when we talk about the option for channeling the benefit, the, 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 the question uh, is like, do we really need special uh, mechanism or a channeling process for Red Plus. What we already identify that we have a PNPM maybe related community as a, one of the platform for channeling the uh, benefit from the Red Plus, and also like when we talk about the performance base, how we defining the performance, maybe based on the emission reductions, and then input base is like how the government uh, provide enabling condition for make us ready to implement it uh, red plus and then the last one I, uh, how we uh, safeguarding all the process uh, implementation of red plus this is one of uh, the last slides is like how we uh, move forward the first one we do believe that now uh, our policy and regulation especially related with the red plus benefit sharing is not yet in place so we will working uh, on these matters uh, seriously and then also clarity on tenorial and then defining who own the carbon or I think more basic question is like who own the forest actually and then yeah implementing safeguards in terms of like 
implementation. We also uh, uh, have a works to integrating our precise with the system information safeguards. I think this is two uh, very good uh, works that we have now, and then we have intention to integrate it, those become one uh, system. And then, yeah, how the capacity, institutional capacity to managing Red Plus uh, benefit from the national into the sub-national up to the site level. And then how to make sure that benefit can contribute in addressing drivers of deforestation, especially creating incentive, the positive incentive for who perform well in Indonesia, because if we know that actually the formal title of Red Plus in international process is like a positive incentive. So we need to proving that Red Plus is uh, one of the uh, positive incentive for improvement of uh, forest governance in Indonesia. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was quite overwhelming to hear uh, and to think about all the aspects that you have to consider when designing a national uh, benefit sharing system as opposed to a local one. Um, okay, I'd like to open the discussion to the audience. Um, and I, can I suggest that um, if you have a question, I'll probably take three or four at, at one time. And can you stand up because you're a really long way away and um, uh, mention who you are and where you come from and keep your questions short and to the point to make it easier for the, the respondents. Okay, anyone willing to start? Uh, okay, there's a gentleman over there and maybe this lady at the front. Anyone on this side? You're all a bit quiet. If not, I'll take you in the middle. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Deepak from Nepal, but currently doing master's in um, Australian National University of Australia. The, I have kind of curiosity uh, about the carbon money uh, benefit sharing mechanism, especially relating to the presentation uh, of Dr. Naya Sarma. Well, uh, According to the carbon money uh, flow mechanism that you have shown in your presentation, it seems almost 100% uh, carbon money goes to the community. But currently, Nepal's European has been selected. Uh, if I'm not that, if I'm not wrong, that is uh, for around six million dollar uh, is coming to Nepal. But I have heard that. That European project is going to be implemented in the southern part of the Nepal. With that, you have said that's the more uh, uh, economically important forest, but very few community forest users group are formed. So, in this scenario, I'm not sure whether the current money uh, or benefit sharing mechanism that you have shown in your presentation is owned by government or not, and do you see any challenges? Uh, to ensure the 100% or more benefit to the community in the European present, uh, implementation area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the lady in red at the front. Thank you for all the interesting presentation. And I have one question, and that is for Vietnam, about the incentive mechanism, the PFAS. And I just like you to uh, give us more of your opinion how convincible of the payment when compared with other land use alternative because the information you provide is like the payment is 20 US dollar per hectare per year. How it gonna be like when you compare with other land use conversion for coffee plantation, rubber or oil plantation. And also, if it's not, how, what would be the strategy to make this payment is more economic viable? Thank you. Thank you. Um, go in the front. Hello. Yeah, my question is for, my name is Joshua from the Jakarta Group. My question is for Mr. Nair Sharma um, from the Community Forest just now. And my question would be, how exactly can CF's experience help forest conservation efforts in Indonesia, I mean, what concrete ways or rather specific ways um, can you think of when you uh, talk about uh, helping Indonesia in its forest conservation efforts? Thank you. 
Okay, so we have three distinct questions for distinct people. Um, do you want to start, Dr. Powdell, uh, the question about um, the carbon money coming into the higher value forest in the Terai um, and what challenges you see for the model you presented? Um, I think um, here again the question of tenure and benefits um, very closely related because in Tarai or wherever where there is no community forestry, um, we don't have clear mechanism to benefit or to ensure the benefits to local communities because uh, in rest of the like if 25% forest is with the communities, that means 75% forest is with the government. And those people um, living in and around those forests, they don't have any legitimate, legal, formal ways to claim benefit from those forests. So that means uh, if any red money comes to those forests, we don't have any mechanism how to benefit the communities or people living around those forests. And that means um, um, we can't get their support to protect those forests. So we have only provision for community forests um, because there we have existing system of benefit sharing. But for all communities in non-community forest areas, there is no any um, existing system. And that uh, puts the red in a risk because unless we have any established system to ensure benefits to those communities, we wouldn't have red in those uh, other forests. So certainly that applies to valuable forest in Tarai because currently we don't have any scheme to benefit those communities. Um, the second... Um, how Nepal's community forest experience can Was your question to help? Dr. Powdell? Yeah. 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 Um, no, I don't have very no, other prescription for uh, this huge country with the diverse forest uh, tenure regime here. But simply from there, from Nepal, what I can say is you know, we have a very action proven experience that if you transfer rights to use, to manage, to exclude others and to benefit from a range of forest product, certainly you, should, you would be ensuring the protection of forest. So even there is no raid or anything, we have already protected forest in those areas. So that is a lesson for any other countries <laughs> from Nepal. Thank you. Um, and maybe to move on to the second question, would you like to, to take that? The question of can the, the level of payments from the PFES actually match the opportunity costs um, for land? Yeah. Thanks for the very nice question. Uh, I should say that the, for the water accessible section services is a high opportunity cost uh, of converting forest to the other lands you, for example, the conversion to the maize or coffee or cassava, uh, etc. So um, uh, we should uh, we will in, uh, combining, uh, uh, we will should propose to combine with PFAS with other uh, government and also non-government non program. Uh, it's lucky for our country that now so many international uh, organizations uh, uh, regards about the uh, PFAS policy such as IUCN, C4, and uh, ZSS, uh, um, and uh, Windows International, etc. So um, uh, uh, the PFAS, uh, the combining PFAS with other program uh, to get more uh, resources of uh, funding for forest protection. Um, actually, there, there's uh, it's very challenging that uh, two different uh, levels of payment. Uh, so uh, in the um, uh, quarter three, uh, we will organize the workshop on the three-year implemented uh, PFAS in Vietnam, and then maybe we will propose to revise the policy for, for adaptation with, uh, in the uh, uh, current situation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, are there any more questions, burning questions? There's a burning one here. Someone far at the back. And anything else? And one at the back on the left. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, my name is Lucas from CIFR. I would like to know a little bit more about the ownership system in Myanmar of forests so that we can understand the process by which uh, there have been some impacts in the livelihoods of the people. Is it related to land privatization? Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Didi from Climate and Development Knowledge Network. My question is simple. Uh, if we are talking about the payment for ecosystem service and that is for water, would it make sense to also consider PES for renewable energy? I mean, this water also provides power for micro hydro and the local people can benefit from electricity. It can help them with their livelihoods if there is electricity. So renewable energy and maybe also protection from, from floods and other disaster. Can it be made for ecosystem uh, service? My question is to uh, the gentleman from Nepal because you already have a lot of views. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was somebody over here. Uh, thank you. My name is Susi. I am from Forda Solo, Ministry of Forestry. Uh, I have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is to Mr. Pham Van Trung. Uh, I'm very impressed actually because uh, uh, Vietnam successfully reduced degradation uh, by uh, approximately 40 percent. Uh, however, uh, I'm wondering uh, how you how you fulfill the timber demand uh, in that situation. And uh, while you mention your forest area only approximately 40 percent with forested land. And the second one to Mr. Iwan. Um, you mentioned non-carbon benefit uh, that is strengthened community rights. Uh, my question is, uh, how about uh, the other rights? Is uh, the scheme can ensure that uh, the community rights uh, be uh, stronger than the other rights? Uh, I think you know uh, what I mean. Uh, the second one is uh, you, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, we are still waiting when the money for carbon is, will, will come. Um, my question is, have you calculated uh, how much money have been spent on research or other activities other than direct or indirect benefits for forest owners or forest guides? in this um, community. Thank you. Thank you. What a nice audience you are. You've provided one question for each respondent. Um, can we start with Myanmar and the, the, some background to the ownership, forest ownership system? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> in the, usually, forests are managed by the government ministry. Um, we use forest, so uh, community use forest, but community never own the forest land. But there are many, <coughs> uh, there has been many land encroachment issue within the forest area. And for us, uh, the, uh, in 1992, the forest law was promulgated and we realized that there are many people already encroach the land and get down the tree. And, uh, and uh, in the morning presentation, I, I noticed that uh, uh, Indonesia had the same experience in recording the land because of the technology, we do not have, in 1980s around in Indonesia, they did not have uh, remote sensing in order to um, record how many acres of land uh, 
covered by the forest and, and how many acres are not covered by the forest, etc. The same problem we have been facing, and we have no such a kind of uh, uh, specific data that much uh, area is covered by the forest and not that much area is covered by the forest. And um, we keep the data from the, I mean, very old age, in, even from the British era, it, it, it around like 100 years ago, we, we keep that as it is. <clears throat> That's why we try to change the data at the moment. <clears throat> and in terms of demarcation, there are two government departments responsible for <clears throat> land utilization uh, for rural land and agricultural land and urban land. Is, uh, rural land and, and agricultural land is done by Ministry of Agri uh, Agriculture and Irrigation. Urban land is managed by um, Ministry of For uh, Home Affairs. And uh, apart from that land, uh, all the forest area is managed by the Ministry of uh, Forestry. So in terms of ownership, we hardly know who owns a, 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 a forest. And com uh, it is a common property, and, and, and Dylan, unless we do not uh, uh, produce kind of timber for, and logging from the forest, only the private uh, business, uh, uh, huge businessmen can produce timber from the forest of the country. And, and uh, no community member can produce like this. But we, we regard that forest is our own, uh, our own common property. We have to protect, but uh, not for the businessmen. They do as, uh, as they want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question was to Nepal and the issue of um, whether pests in yeah. terms of renewable energy or issues such as flood protection makes sense. Um, thank you. I think the, the hydropower based pests in community forestry is interesting. Uh, we have very um, bad example, um, bad in a sense. You now we have a provision that uh, wherever there is a hydropower uh, plant, uh, the local government would get uh, I think 12.5% of the profit from the electricity sale. <clears throat> and that money goes to local government um, uh, whose mandate is actually development. And then the local government invests the money in building roads in the Nepalese you know, hills and that is actually you know, contributing to the degradation, siltation, landslide of the watershed which were meant to protect by the incentive given by the hydroelectricity company. Yeah? So here is a mismatch between the intention and the outcome because you are giving money to protect the watershed, to incentivize protection of watershed, but actually the money go, went to the, through the local government and their mandate is not primarily resource conservation but primarily development and they invested in uh, constructing road and that contributed to degradation of the watershed. So unless we have uh, some mechanism to target the particular institution with the mandate to conserve the resources, uh, we won't get result. Um, but on, until now, we don't have uh, the legal framework that community forest user groups uh, getting benefit from hydroelectricity uh, money. Uh, but in, term, in volunteer sense, in some of the cases, not in hydropower case, but in drinking water case, where there is a municipality nearby the community forest, so there, is, there are uh, internal understanding between the forest user group and the municipality, and the municipalities are paying money to forest user group, but these practices are not yet coded in the legal language. Thank you. Um, and the question for you was? Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. That uh, uh, what we, uh, I'm trying to understand what your question is like, if we uh, strengthening community rights, it means we weakening the rights of the others. I think we will not put it that way because why this idea coming is like because we have a long experience working under concessions. And then until today, we don't have 
proper and enough platform, especially for community, let's say, to, ref to verify their claim. So that's why I think to working on this area will help us also to understanding which area have community claim, where is the adat claim, and then also we can provide it the platform how to facilitate this claim, to check this claim, to verify this claim, and then I think if we can succeed on this case, I think that's one of the biggest benefit that we have from the Red Plus. And of course, uh, I think the private sector, for example, when working in the concession have much better capacity to make things become clearer, at least under their boundaries. But when we talk about the community, it's uh, very difficult in many cases to make them uh, claiming their rights. And then if we talk about these rights, it's not only about the land rights, but also like how we can use a forest to strengthen community cultural identity. Because if we go to Kalimantan, they not only use a forest like for take non-timber forest product, but also for practicing their culture. I think in that context, we need to put that how we can strengthening their uh, rights. I think I, think I will yeah, stop there. There yeah. was one second question from okay. the lady about have you calculated how much has been spent on the, the readiness aspect yeah. of benefit? Yeah, I think uh, specifically calculated like the, the breakdown is not. But if we see like there are so many uh, readiness initiatives in Indonesia, I think that's, uh, I don't know, comparing to the other country, I think Indonesia is one of the biggest recipient for readiness fund from FCPF, Indonesia, Norway, and then the other uh, commitment is related also for now for readiness. And like, for example, if we can see that one of the initiative under Baby Red Plus is like creating one map initiative, that's also one of the benefits that we want to see that in the future Indonesia have a better database, have a better information on the forest and then at the end the people will use the same map. Because in many cases when we talk about Indonesia data, people will asking which data you use. And I think this is also a readiness uh, benefit we got that we have a better uh, information, we have a better data, and I think with or without that in the future, we will need it anyway. So, yeah, if you're asking me about the exact number, it's quite difficult to answer now, but I think it's important. I think we can encourage colleagues from C4 to have a research on that, like <laughs> how uh, the influence of readiness efforts in Indonesia can improving, let's say, forest governance in Indonesia. So we can say that Red Plus is a good one for Indonesia because we got a lot of benefits, not only carbon benefits. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And there was one more question, I think it was for Vietnam, on um, the issue of timber demand. Um, who was the, who was asking this question? Oh, another, the, the lady from Forda. How you deal with the, the with the supply of timber? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, in Vietnam we have a uh, um, 13.5 million hectare uh, totally until now. 13.5 million hectare, and in there around uh, one four point one million hectare were determined for implement PFAS. Uh, Actually, we have regulation for the uh, local community to use uh, timber in the forest. But in uh, the the, the PFAS, um, uh, in the within the PFAS uh, policy, uh, we already give out the, the K coefficient. It, uh, for the K one is uh, regulated for the quality of forest. But actually, until now, we still not yet fully applied uh, for the uh, K coefficient. Uh, so we hope that um, in uh, after 2016, uh, because we are now implementing the, 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 the program on the forest inventory, uh, at that time we will have a, a finger 
uh, information or data about the forest and maybe we will implement for the uh, forest uh, quality uh, relating to the K coefficient. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. I'm under pressure to wrap up the session now, um, but before doing so, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to um, come up with one key message. Tomorrow morning there's a high-level panel, and um, the rapporteur will, will need to take uh, messages to that panel. Um, and to make her job easy, um, I'm going to ask you to give a one sentence. If you can do it in 140 te um, characters so that it can be tweeted immediately, even better. Uh, okay, over to you. Who's ready to go? You look ready to go. <laughs> um, like I explained at the beginning, I, I became to aware that the, that kind of uh, red plus mechanism, forest application and forest submit, but the presentation I prepared from the perspective of uh, land, land, you, land, use, um, uh, land use, then uh, my key message is uh, for Myanmar, in terms of carbon emission, we have, uh, I would say, less responsible for that. But we have to balance now at the moment for the country development between um, development and sustainable, equitable uh, for the Bua. So we, uh, in, in terms of key message, we would like to convey that uh, uh, we have to be, our policy formulation uh, uh, has to be comprehensive and pro poor uh, whereas we are welcoming, we are inviting more uh, development technology uh, and uh, also, you know, direct investment. Yep. Thank you. Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> I should say that for the key message is uh, implementing the policy relating to the PFAS uh, should be strongly supported or committed from uh, all the level, uh, from the local community to the uh, central authority. Yeah. Well, from Nepal experience, it's uh, if you have clear, comprehensive, and secure tenure rights, supported by strong policy, law and institutional framework that would certainly incentivize conservation what we are looking under pace or raid or anything. I think that is the key lesson, tenure, tenure and tenure rights. Yeah, thank you. I think for Indonesia that we want to see that Red Plus will working not only uh, for carbon but also how we can strengthening the community rights. The second one is like how to incentivize who perform well. So I mean it's a positive incentive. And then the third one, if like how to make sure that Red Plus can addressing the level of deforestation and improve the forest governance in Indonesia. I think that's Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the speakers for a really fascinating discussion at many levels and many sectors. Um, I'd like to thank the audience. And um, yeah, will you join me in giving the speakers a round of applause? Thank you very much.